Hello and welcome to Business News Wales. I'm John Jackson, the Built Environment Editor, and in this discussion we focus on sustainable buildings in our built environment. Joining me are guests architect Andrew Street, who is Studio Director at the IBI Group's Cardiff office, along with architect Patrick McMorrow from the IBI Group's Vancouver office. Now the IBI Group itself is a leading global architecture, engineering, planning and technology firm that works extensively to help define the places that we live in our cities. And based on Andrew's experience, he is perfectly placed to talk to us about sustainability, including uh, something which is very relevant to us in Wales, plans by the Welsh NHS to create their own sustainable estate. Meanwhile, over in Vancouver, Patrick uh, is a passive house trained consultant and is currently working on delivering a 750 bed passive house residence at the University of Toronto, along with a seven storey new build passive house workspace for the City of Vancouver's cultural industry sector. Thank you both for joining us today. But just ahead of our discussion, uh, would you like to take the opportunity just to explain a little bit more to our viewers about what you do? And maybe, Andrew, if I could ask you to start. Sure. Thanks, John. Thanks for uh, having us uh, explain and, and chat with you about these issues. So um, as you've already mentioned, we're kind of a global architecture and technology practice. So as well as being architects, um, we've got colleagues who develop smart motorway technology, optimise sort of people movement in large cities at significant events, such as the 2012 Olympics in London. And so as architects, we've got access to these skills to inform some of the buildings we design, which is a great kind of resource to build on. So for example, we're using parametric modeling um, developed by our technology colleagues to optimize and test designs and solutions early in the design process. Um, and we're exploring the use of sensors and apps to manage people movement sort of through buildings such as those in healthcare and education. So uh, we're, we're a big uh, multidisciplinary architectural practice with six largest uh, architecture practice in the, in the world based on the number of architects employed. Um, <clears throat> predominantly, we're based in North America, but we've got offices in the UK, Europe, and Middle East. Uh, so there's 60 offices in, in total. In the UK, we're eight offices, and I'm the studio director in Cardiff. So um, in Cardiff, we predominantly design healthcare and education and research buildings, although we're quite nicely involved in some small, interesting community buildings as well, uh, which are as a nice departure and an addition to the portfolio. Um, I personally lead the healthcare team in Wales and in the Southwest, uh, and our studio is currently heavily involved uh, delivering seven projects from the NHS Buildings for Wales programme and framework. Uh, that includes kind of three health and wellbeing centres, which are integrating primary care with community and third sector services. We're also designing a new... Um, Satellite Radiotherapy Treatment Centre, which is part of a wider transformation of cancer services in Wales. Um, we're doing designing a new 63-bed mental health unit and also, uh, I guess, on the larger master planning side of things, uh, looking at whole hospital sites infrastructure and how that can be improved uh, for the future. So that's a, a very quick canter over what, what I'm involved with and um, kind of the bigger picture for IBI. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. And, you know, it is impressive. And I guess you get a lot of benefit by being, uh, you know, obviously having this space in Cardiff, but being part of a much larger global practice, there must be opportunities to learn uh, from other things which are happening in different parts of the world. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think um, that that is a uh, an invaluable resource really to draw on, um, just being able to kind of send an email off to a colleague in Toronto to ask about their experience on a project or, or wherever in the world and kind of learn very quickly about uh, how certain solutions were arrived at is, is, a, is a real benefit, yeah. And in, in which case, of course, um, I'd now like to ask Patrick to do the same and explain just a little bit about what he does and we'll see <laughs> how many projects he's involved in too. Yeah, thanks, John. Um... Yeah, to introduce myself, I'm an architect trained in Ireland and I've been working with IBI in Vancouver on um, Passive House certified projects. Um, so that's um, projects which are aiming for very low energy use. 
And um, I've been lucky enough to get exposure to building, like you mentioned, a seven-story artist residence in downtown Vancouver and then a large student residence. And so that experience has been kind of spread across Canada from a cold climate to a mild climate. And and now I'm getting to work with the UK offices and, and I've uh, been working with Andrew on these healthcare uh, projects and kind of bringing some of the experience that I've gained um, with those buildings under construction in Canada and, um, you know, merging that with the, the, the vast experience that Andrew's office has in, in Wales. It was a brilliant combination by the sounds of it. Um, sustainability itself, I mean, it is a huge topic and obviously we can only cover so much today. So I think it would perhaps help just if you can, and, and in simple terms, just begin by explaining what in terms of architecture sustainability actually means. Okay, so uh, as you rightly say, John, it's a, it's a massive topic, a big subject and I think to try and define it, kind of have to look at look, look to other uh, people to guide us. Really, so uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals describes st- sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. I think that's got a, a helpful definition, and uh, it goes on to, I guess, shed a bit more light on really how large a topic that is by saying it, it's kind of. Um, focused on four dimensions, really, the society, environment, culture and economy. So I think that, that shows how, how big a topic it is. I, I think what is helpful is the ROBA define this further um, by putting together some sort of measurable goals uh, as to what sustainable development might actually look like. Um, so I, I guess um, in, in the past, one of the issues has been it's easy to talk a good game in terms of sustainability without actually demonstrating its success or, or measuring the outcome. So the RBA's sustainable outcomes focus on net zero operational carbon, um, net zero embodied carbon, sustainable water cycle, sustainable connectivity and transport, sustainable land use and biodiversity, good health and well-being, sustainable communities and social value, and sustainable life cycle costs. So I think um, for architecture, uh, sustainability probably means that we need to be able to demonstrate an evidence that um, development's having a positive impact on those sort of eight aspects of development. I think that's helpful from the RBA to have kind of defined that for us uh, and to help us to focus really and measure um, what sustainable development is. Does that then, um, Patrick, for example, does that become a challenge having to do all of that, but also say within that word budget as well? Yeah, good question, John. I mean, um, I would say it's a broad range, but when we look at projects from the outset under a lens of sustainability, um, we can kind of manage, uh, manage the targets and goals to ensure that budget is integrated into every measure we take as architects and designers. Um, for example, in high performance buildings that are using less energy, um, the, the additional cost premium to construct is significantly reduced when that decision is made from the outset. And we say this is going to be a high performance building to this standard. It kind of informs a lot of the decisions we make early in the project to do with massing, siting, um, amount of windows, the type of mechanical systems or, or Maybe I'm going into too much detail, but, you know, these are the things that come to mind when I think about the budget and how we're going to control it from the beginning. Brilliant. And I guess, you know, if I walk back in time a little bit and I'm looking at sort of the 1950s, 60s international style architecture where you've got the skyscrapers, which could be literally in any city anywhere. Am I right in thinking that now in order to achieve sustainability, we need to more than ever consider the actual geographical location of where the building is going to be. And if that is what a factor, what other considerations does sustainability bring into architecture that we're not currently having to be perhaps so concerned about? I guess um, at architecture school, you, you're always taught that site analysis and a good brief are crucial right from the start uh, and that proposals need to respond to their context. So. Um, 
I guess one of the reasons that this is emphasised and it forms such an integral part of every project is that the site location and its geography, as you've pointed out, John, um, has always played that important role in, in shaping positive development. And um, that's definitely the case. And it uh, has a massive role to play in shaping sustainable development too, I think. So um, we're, we're, we're relying on and, and harnessing the benefits that any site or any geography has to offer to make uh, and make the most of them really for that for that building develop and that development. So some some of those considerations, uh, I think Patrick's already touched on really it, orientation of the building right from the outset. Um, uh, getting that right uh, is is hugely important, so we can benefit from things like so solar gains in the winter months and reduce the heating demand on, on buildings. Um, orientating spaces to make the most of interior daylight so that the, the well-being of building users is enhanced. Um, I think if, if there's biodiversity um, existing there on, on the site to make the most of that, to, to kind of harness that and, and uh, enhance it where possible. Um, I think the way in which we can consider uh, the local communities in which some of the buildings are developed is really important so that we can look at local sourcing of materials, maybe how we can involve communities in the design and the development of the buildings to provide that sort of community sustainability aspect to projects. Um, I think there's opportunities to reuse existing buildings on the site. Um, so uh, we, we look at that at the early stages. I mean, sometimes we would start by uh, just considering the viability of, of, of reusing existing buildings in their current state and, and kind of retrofitting them. Um, but, but equally that could be in, in demolitions and uh, kind of crushing material, et cetera. Um, so th there, are, there are lots of considera considerations and that's just some of them, I guess. I don't, Patrick's probably got some yeah. more to add in. Yeah, Andrew, I think you're, the, you're um, getting into the whole subject of the embodied carbon in the building, aren't you? about reusing older buildings and circular economies of sourcing materials locally. And um, like to give a global context, I think the UK is really um, uh, making strides ahead there to, um, to put in um, like a framework for measuring um, the amount of carbon that's used up in producing mm. a building, you know, from um, cradle to grave or from cradle to cradle again, like how the building will be reused afterwards. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, to be honest with you. And um, one of the things I've always found interesting, Patrick, and I was reading a little bit about it in uh, Charles Montgomery's book, Happy City, and you know, he quotes Vancouver uh, as being quite an exemplary city in many ways uh, for its built environment. But from your experience, what lessons could the smaller cities in Wales learn from a city such as Vancouver, perhaps particularly around sustainability? Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, from an urbanism point of view, Vancouver is kind of celebrated for having a density um, that that promotes um, walking, cycling, public transit. Um, so that's more on a, a broader scale how um, city planning can um, encourage us to live more low carbon lifestyles. Um, because my focus is on sustainable building, I could give mm. some examples on how the yeah, the city council has um, encouraged the passive house standard and ha has embraced that standard, but that could be any other standard um, that say, for example, net, uh, net zero carbon building, uh, which could be encouraged by city councils and um, bonuses could be offered, for example, in density is one thing we've seen in Vancouver where uh, building to a higher performance standard could get you additional density on a site. It's interesting with density because it, with COVID-19, I think there's been a lot of confusion between overcrowding and density and good density works. It doesn't create an unhealthy environment, but equally here in the UK, Andrew, we've got the cladding crisis as well, which in a sense, I, I can only worry is going to make people uh, cautious of increasing densities in our cities. And now I don't know whether that'll just be a short term thing, but it would seem to me, and this is why I think Vancouver is a good example about being able to show how good density can work to create a very sustainable, high quality living environment. 
Yeah, and I, I think um, I reached out, John, when I saw that sort of question coming our way to um, some other colleagues in, in Toronto. And um, I, th I think what seems to be successful, again, in those cities is the uh, engagement that they have with their communities to work out what um, they would like to see to underpin and kind of make their, their um, ecosystem sustainable, I suppose. And so kind of walkable communities, that uh, walkable streets, kind of sunlight into kind of deep plan high rise areas, uh, the built form, um, uh, those sort of things that are really important to them and, and they're consulted on throughout the process. So I, I think investing in spaces between buildings are seemingly very important in, in places like Toronto and Vancouver. And I think that would be something that in Wales we would uh, love to mimic. It's great. It is a pure case, isn't it, of getting the details right. And of details, Andrew, obviously in Wales, we know the NHS has got a very significant physical presence uh, in the built environment. Is it going to be challenging, uh, particularly challenging even, to make this estate sustainable? As you say, John, um, NHS in Wales is responsible for a significant element of the built environment. And um, this is spread it's quite a a diverse estate as well that they're working within the building stock spans significant time scales um, and making its estate as sustainable is, is, is a huge challenge um, but it's, it's one I think where we're seeing a plan emerging so um, NHS Wales and Shared Services Partnership has recently published its draft decarbonisation strategy uh, which kind of sits alongside other Welsh government initiatives and, and kind of legislation. And it, it's a 10 year plan to reduce carbon emissions by at least 34% from where it is currently. Um, so that there's definitely a plan emerging um, and, and underpinning that plan that they're starting by um, signing up initially to the climate emergency. Um, and they are mandating that all new build developments and major refurbishments are designed to the Green Building Council's net zero hospital framework. That's not quite out yet, but it should be published later this year. Um, so that's a, a real step in a, a positive direction to achieving those targets. Um, it's also targeting estates by developing low carbon heating plans and making the most of uh, digital and telemedicine to kind of reduce travel. I think we've seen that in COVID, haven't we? The, mm -hmm opportunity to make the most of digital and technology to um, get access to health services. So I think that's going to be something that will support a reduced travel um, kind of plan. And then finally, I think it's tar targeting buildings by 2030, having undergone energy efficient upgrades with low carbon heat and renewable energy potential fully acted on. So there's a, there's a very clear kind of pathway that, uh, to trying to achieve that and um, we're seeing that um, kind of ambitious type come through on a number of the projects we're working on. Um, so our most recent commission will be targeting a net zero um, carbon solution to the to the project. So uh, I, th I think there's a, a positive direction of travel that we can see for for the NHS in Wales. That's that's fantastic. It's going to be very interesting to see that happen. Um, I guess because there's targets here, there and everywhere. But if I just put you both on the spot very briefly, in the next five years, for example, what would you think are the main priorities to ensure that building net zero buildings will become, if you like, the new norm? Do you want to start, Patrick? <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to lead. So, well, I mean, I think initially, John, government backing for me and funding support being maintained and in, increased. So that, that government will, I think, is really important. And we're seeing that with the NHS projects, uh, but also with others. I know we'll touch on the Swansea Bay Technology Centre, but the, the support that that's had as well has, has been important. Um, I think clients, those pe the people that commission buildings being committed to putting sustainability at the forefront of the projects and not as a, just a bolt on, I think it is something that uh, is hope hopeful to see for the future. Um, I think a, a more detailed framework to design to as well. Um, Architects Climate Action Network are, are pushing to coordinate guidance for projects and specific to building types. So 
Um, the sustainable approaches for, for homes are, are different to hospitals, so making them building specific is, is super important. Um, I think manufacturers of building products um, can help with all of this to make sure that their product ranges and the data that kind of inform life cycle assessments are more easily available to, to us designers. Um, actually building these buildings require um, some upskilling and for the contractors and, and the, the builders mm -hmm. to um, go on that journey with us, I think. Um, and then I think fi finally, the other aspect that I, I thought about really that um, for the next five years is kind of developing that framework for offsetting any residual carbon and, and what that might look like. Uh, and so that all parties right at the start of a project uh, is clear um, on what that looks like. So th that's my thoughts. I know that Patrick, you want to... Yeah, I think your that? last point, Andrew, is really interesting that buildings could become you know, net um, positive buildings for carbon. So uh, for the beginning of their life, they may be offsetting, but at some point they may be, uh, uh, buildings will be, you know, um, producing extra electricity and uh, putting that out in the grid and then offsetting carbon in that in that sense. Um, so that's a long-term investment in buildings that, that they'll become a resource in time producing carbon credits. But Mm -hmm. um, I also like just anecdotally the um, the upskilling and training of the construction sector. I think is is really interesting. Um, mm. uh, there's a passive house tradesperson course, for example, that uh, on our project, the contractor um, engaged uh, all their tradespeople and the consultant team to undertake and. That's a, a short course to do with air tightness strategies on building sites because that's so important in high performance buildings and it's about um, how you maintain those air tightness across the building envelope um, how you uh, work on continuous uh, insulation throughout the building and um, I just thought that was an interesting place where you could see growth happening and upskilling in construction industry. I think we can see and hope that there are huge um, employment opportunities in Wales for new highly skilled jobs doing exactly that, particularly with um, modern methods of construction. And I, I guess, and what I like the idea of is with the technology center in Swansea Bay, actually physically seeing the building, I think is gonna be really encouraging for people. You know, you can see the future, the plans always look great and all, all the stories about them, but in your own locality to be able to actually physically go and see the building, see it operating, Hopefully there'll be a little panel showing you how much extra power it's generating. But when you can see it, I think that will help to act as, if you like, a spark, I suppose, to encourage others to see, well, this is the future. Now let's all jump on board. Which leads me on to another one of my questions. And I'm just gonna ask, are we living now at a time when the technology and the construction methods that we need to create a sustainable built environment are they still emerging or how close do you feel that we are to having an optimum solution or is it always going to be the case that we're going to keep improving? Um, so I think there are some good established approaches to sustainable development but the solutions and technologies themselves are still emerging and being refined and probably in all honesty John I think we'll always need to. Hmm. Um, I think the, the fabric first approaches in line with passive house principles that Patrick has, has been talking about are, are well established, but delivering solutions that are also low embodied carbon have probably got some ways to go. Uh, and particularly balancing that with the importance of fire safety and construction. Um, so I, I think the evolving environment that we work in means that the technologies will always have to evolve and adapt to certain situations. Um, I think you mentioned modern me methods of construction. I think there's a no noticeable emphasis on the role of MMC and, and offsite solutions to minimize carbon impact in construction. So we're seeing these pro products and technologies being used more and, and emphasized more, um, but not, not yet to the extent I think possible. I, I guess there's some resistance um, because they can be perceived as being a bit dull and a bit kind of um, mono, mono, monotone. Um, but we're, we're seeing quite impressive facade solutions being achieved through large offsite panel assemblies. So 
I think the future for, for MMC is um, is definitely one that's going to be explored further. And then I think there's also a fantastic opportunity for some technologies that are in their infancy, I suppose, at the moment that are, that are building products that capture and lock in carbon. Uh, so such as kind of interior paint systems, there's biochar based cladding products available, algae facade panels, hempcrete and biophilic planted facades. So there's all these kind of weird and wonderful things as well out there that are untapped and unrealized yet, I think, which can, they can take that carbon um, debate further. Brilliant. And how does that reflect your experience, Patrick? Yeah, while Andrew was speaking, I was just thinking about new technologies and I realized there's lots of windows in my background here and that's not typical for a passive house, right? But um, uh, what it got me thinking about was uh, electrochromatic glass and that's a new technology that can be used to kind of limit the overheating on buildings and kind of links back to your comment maybe about, you know, the modernist style with large expanses of glass and, yeah. and a connection to the outside which can be seen as biophilic architecture as well and, and I think is important so when we think about it we're we're aiming for um, a new standard of, of performance in buildings that hasn't been achieved um, like in on mass scale before so we are at the infancy and there's lots of growth to happen um, lots of potential for innovation um, for new products and new techniques for building and electrochromatic glass is just one example, yeah. And then I keep seeing, and I know it's been around for a while, but I don't see many examples, or I physically haven't seen many examples, where um, those vertical greening systems are put into place. Now, it always looks amazing to see a building that looks like a forest. And sometimes I worry that it could just become a trend and you'll get tokenistic bits of green on the front of a building. But done properly, it's actually got a really important role that it can play within a building and it's structured. Do you think we'll be seeing much more greenery in our cities in the future? Yeah, I hope so. Um, I think there's huge potential for vertical walls of green in cities um, at any scale that can encourage, you know, um, biodiversity within the city um, connections between parks, um, you know, um, green greening rooftops um, it's all potential uh, for um, actually producing carbon and what's interesting is how we'll begin to account for that whether buildings and the landscape they sit in um, you know are actually absorbing carbon and putting that into the soil and that's that's a really important way of uh, reducing carbon emissions in the built environment that's fantastic now then i'm gonna ask uh, the final... just to... oh, sorry, Andrew. Oh, sorry. no 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 go on. no sorry sorry I was just going to add to that, really. I think mean, COVID's probably shone a, a spotlight, hasn't it, on green spaces within our cities and access to those spaces and the need for the inhabitants of cities to get access to those spaces. So I think um, with Patrick, really, there will be a big emphasis as we come out of this kind of to uh, make sure that they are included within developments, in, particularly in city centres. I know we're looking at a scheme um, where... With, with some GPs and traditionally they would want ground floor access uh, and it's a seven or eight story building and, and they, they've opted to be on the top floor because they want to be able to have access to uh, a roof terrace and garden um, for those very reasons. So I think we are seeing a bit of a shift in the, the, the sort of uptake of these sort of spaces. That's fantastic. Well, I'll uh, ask you a final question now, um, just to put you on the spot again. If you were to suggest just one building or project that really exemplifies sustainability, which one would you um, want to tell us about? I think I'm um, biased at the moment towards the Swansea Bay Technology Centre that we're kind of alluded to or, already. Um, I think the fact that um, right from the outset of the building that, that the brief was defined and we had a, uh, a very clear direction of travel towards a, a sustainable and energy positive building. Um, so we were able to kind of use our um, uh, parametric design software to maximize the orientation of the building so that um, we could get the most out of the um, PV panels that were proposed. So the facades all clad in, um, the south and west facades are clad in PV panels. 
uh, as well as the whole roof. And together with other technologies, it results in that being an energy positive building. And that um, technology is being designed in such a way that the excess energy from the building will be converted into hydrogen at the nearby hydrogen center for, to fuel hydrogen vehicles. So um, I think it's a really good case study for kind of energy, energy positive buildings. Uh, it's also flexible in its design so that it can be adapted in the future um, so that user occupancies as they may change uh, the building, inter interior can change with it. And finally, I think uh, it kind of is a good example of the local government demonstrating its commitment to sustainable development because uh, it's part funded from the region's supporting innovation and low carbon growth program. So I think it's a, a good all rounder in terms of sustainable design. That's a brilliant example, Andrew. And like we've said, its potential to inspire others um, is excellent. I think it's also going to work very well to, if you like, get people to notice Swansea and what's happening in Swansea. And that's great from any city perspective, you know, doing the right things and doing them well. Um, that's hugely important. So, you know, I can't wait to see the building completed, to be honest with you. Uh, that's been really inspiring. Now, Patrick, you've had time to think of your own um, top recommendations. So <laughs> if you say your house, I'm not having it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I have to think of another one. Yeah, I, I suppose I'd like to talk tell you about the the University of Toronto student residence. Um, it's a design build project uh, I'm working on right now and uh, with a, a large uh, contractor led team. And what's really interesting is that it's the first certified a large passive house project in, in that cold climate of Toronto. And as you know, the colder the climate, uh, the larger the heating demand generally is. Um, and so um, this building is kind of breaking the mold in that it's um, it's managing to achieve 750 beds, um, um, but do it in a cost efficient manner. You know, the project delivery is focused on schedule and budget, um, but the, um, the, the target for sustainability and energy measures is, is very strictly set out at the beginning. And that's just taken on board by the whole project team. So it's been really exciting to see everyone kind of rowing together with the same goal um, and, you know, we're well on track to achieving that goal, um, even though at the moment it's just uh, um, pouring the slab on grade. We're still a ways to, to seeing a seven story building that's operating at this uh, performance of, you know, 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared heating. That's that's what we're always aiming for with our low perform, low energy, high performance buildings. Um, but yeah, on the whole, I just think at a large scale, it's really exciting to see a building achieving that standard in a cold climate. That's brilliant. Uh, that's another one which I think would be absolutely lovely to take a look at when it's uh, when it's been completed. Um, you know, thank you both very much for your time today. Um, as we say, we could talk for days about this. I'm sure we'll revisit the topic in the future. Uh, I will remind all of our viewers that there is an accompanying article at uh, businessnewswales.com, uh, which will have further information and links for people to click on to. Uh, for now, I'd like to thank you very much for watching um, this, this discussion. And of course, thanks to Andrew and Patrick for their time today. Thank you very much now. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. No trouble, and goodbye. Thank you.